Great session. All right, uh, Debbie couldn't make it this evening, uh, so she's not here. Uh, I don't think we really had much business unless Melinda wants to talk about the awards that we got or didn't get. Uh, she's coming up here. Yeah, you gotta do it with the mic. You gotta do it with the mic. Okay. Um, I sent out an email this morning lunchtime, whatever. Uh, I got the results from the um, second round of the color competition. And unfortunately, uh, there were no words given out to any of our entries for that round. I am still waiting for the results from the monochrome competition. I contacted PSA and they're still waiting for three clubs, which I don't understand. But anywho, um, and then there was a revision on the Deadline for round three, it is Sunday, March 26th at midnight, not April 2nd. And that's it. Thank you. No problem. Uh, the only other thing I have is uh, we have a gallery show coming up. It's going to be Gorgon. It's right in the uh, municipal building here in town. Uh, so if you would like to be in that show, just make sure you email me what images you would like and the actual images the names of them, the price of them, and such. I'll send an email out about it. Uh, the other thing is we're going to start doing a year-round gallery. Uh, we're going to be in a radiology place, and basically we're going to do quarterly swap out of probably uh, three different members. They'll have their images in there for three months, and then we'll swap them out for the next three members and their images. Uh, I should have exact numbers, hopefully, tomorrow or the next day. I have to go back out and measure since they finally got their uh, system installed and see how much space we actually have, and we'll go from there. If you are interested in that, make sure you email me and let me know. I can put you on the list of members that are interested so that we have, you know, we're ready and prepared for this each swap out every quarter. Uh, the first quarter is going to be a little messed up since we've lost a couple months already. So we'll probably do, uh, we won't do the swap out until middle of the year. That way the first group will get a couple months in themselves. Uh, it is in uh, East Windsor. So it's right off of uh, 571. Uh, and we're going to be uh, able to display our images there. They're going to be able to be for sale if you want them for sale, obviously. Um, it's gonna be self-maintained. So basically uh, you're gonna to have to, if you are interested in putting images in, you're gonna to have to hang them yourself and you're gonna to have to take them down yourself. Uh, you'll give me your names and your prices and I will make the catalog. That way the catalog is uniform and the name tags are uniform. But other than that, it's going to be a self-served uh, thing. The three people that are, uh, hanging their images for the quarter can help each other. Uh, it's gonna have to be on the same date, whatever date you pick to hang the images and take them down. Hopefully it'll all be the same date as well because we don't want to uh, infringe on the radiology place. It's very active and we wanna be you know, in and out as quick as possible and basically like we were never there. So. Any questions about it, just email me and I should have more information about it, hopefully by the weekend, uh, as far as how many images we're going to need and things like that. Carrie, do you have anything? I will unmute you if you do. I'll unmute you anyway. Yeah, I have a couple of things. Okay, Matt. Yep. Uh, first of all, Photorama. 
Uh, Photorama NJFCC is, uh, they got a good program this year. It's March 25th, all day, same spot it always is, the Middlesex County, uh, uh, Middlesex County College. And um, they're going to have a program of three individual programs, one on landscape, one on birds in flight, and one on macro. And uh, Roman K, I can't pronounce the last name, he's leading all three. Um, he does an excellent job with birds in flight. He'll give you settings. He'll, he, 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 he gives you a lot of information, and there'll probably be a handout. If there isn't, contact him. He'll give you a handout. So those three are worthwhile. Also, afterwards, there's going to be a macro workshop. We may have macro in the, again in, in the future, so it might be worthwhile because I know the images that I put in that got an honorable mention came from macro workshops. And uh, he's going to teach a macro workshop, but then there's going to be a hands-on macro workshop afterwards with photographing. And Tamron is there, and they'll loan you lenses, macro lenses to use during the workshop. Uh, it's $48 for the day. They give you time a, good, a lot of time off for lunch, or you can pay $12, I believe it's $12, and get a bo box lunch right there. So that's the, uh, that's NJFCC. Um, the times I've gone, <clears throat> excuse me, it's always been a good program. <clears throat> One other thing, we're about to, uh, we've started up on the website, the uh, NJFCC competition, the spring competition, for pictorial and nature. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to point out, the cutoff date is March 26th. That's the date you can't enter anything else into our website and we download everything to the NJFCC. Um, just want to remind you again, nature is no hand of man. Pictorial must have a hand of man. And the number of images is two. Two in pictorial and two in nature. No matter how many categories you enter in nature, it's two in total. So if you put one in birds, you're only allowed one in some other category. Don't be misled. I think some people are being misled by the NUM column on our website. It says two for everything. It just means that you're allowed to enter two, but the overriding limits of two for pictorial and two for nature applies. So just keep that in mind. And um, that's about it. Oh yeah, one more thing. Let me just mention one more thing. Down the road, we're not gonna have any more NJFCC competitions until next October when we have the fall, okay? Um, we could use a little help with somebody who has a PC downloading images or uploading, whatever you wanna call it, to the NJFCC. If you have a PC, not a Mac, and you're able to follow detailed instructions, we could use a little help toward the end of the year in starting to give Will a little uh, break from doing this. He's been doing it for many years and maybe help out and just download these images for us. So let us know, let Matt know, or let me know if you think you could help out. It's a logical procedure, a little bit complex, but I'm sure most people could work through it. Okay, that's it, Matt. All right, thank you, Terry. Uh, Will, you have anything about, or uh, Joe, you have anything on the website? You've made some changes, that's about it. Okay. Uh, Linda said we have 53 members now, is that correct? We have money in the bank, so the speaker will get paid today. Um, it's always good. Valerie, you wanna announce the speaker? <laughs> Come on, Valerie. I don't have the uh, bio. <laughs> oh, come on now. You should know. I know. Okay. Stephen Richmond is here tonight. <laughs> He's going to do a great presentation to talk about street photography. I am not prepared to actually go over his bio because they didn't tell me that I would be doing this. You don't, you don't happen to have it up, do you? Okay. Yeah, you do. So he was a former member. Maybe if we'd be nice to him, he'll come back and join us again. 
we're definitely looking forward to that. If I don't have his bio, I can share his bio later. Um, I'll try to find it real quick, but it's not happening. No, okay. <laughs> but we're looking forward to everything that Stephen is going to show us and share with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> I'm really glad to be back. I am glad to be back. Um, I have my wife here with me, Jeannie, and I was a member for quite some time, but back around 2016 or so, I became the chair-elect for the International Law Section of the American Bar Association. So essentially, I was preparing to run uh, an international bar association of some 17,000 to 18,000 members, and that entailed quite a bit of travel. So doing much, uh, and she can tell you, uh, there were times when I would come back on a Monday and fly out again on a Thursday. And the year I was chair, 2017 to 2018, August to August, I touched down on six continents. There was no bar association in Antarctica, so I didn't get there. But I was at least four times to the Far East, uh, China, Japan, uh, not China, Japan, uh, Indonesia, um, Singapore, Australia, and then I think twice to Japan. And really, the last continent that year was in July, just before my term ended, I went down to Chile. So obviously, I, I was there for purposes, we were doing conferences and meetings, but I also had a fair amount of time that I would take early in the morning or otherwise to wander the streets of various cities. Next slide. So the images the image no, one back. Oh no, the overview I'm going to give you is four things we'll talk about. One is understanding street photography, at least as I understand it. Uh, the second are themes and patterns. Third, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rules and then ethical and legal issues. Next. So as I mentioned, in August 2017 to August 2018, I, I traveled all around the, the world. Um, but really, I started taking photographs around 1976. And there's one photograph here from then, which I particularly like. And then really, the bulk of them are over a 20 or so year period. I do have one or two that I put into the slides from a week ago in Japan. I just got back this weekend. And there's a reason that I wanted to include that one. So the selections here perhaps are somewhat arbitrary, uh, as many of you will find when you go through your own photos, something buried, all of a sudden seems to be a gem and you wonder why you didn't see it before. And some of the ones that you've considered a favorite suddenly don't look so good. So that's at least my experience and I have a cross section of what I've done. Next slide. One of the things I've done over the years is not just go out and take pictures, but really studied what I was trying to do. I would read the critical analyses. I would read histories of photography. I'd go to the museums, look at the special exhibits, look at the, the main collection. And one of the interesting things about going around the world is a lot of these places now have their own photography museums. And it's always interesting to see the local photography exhibits or even the local art exhibits. I mean, I remember going to, what was I, in Zagreb in Croatia. So you'll go to the art museum and you'll see Croatian artists that you won't see anywhere else. And I think it was in Croatia or maybe it was Prague, I forget now, but there was a photography exhibit and it's just fascinating because you'll see a whole line of pictures that you will never see anywhere else because they don't get into the anthologies. So it's always good to compare. And one of the things that struck me, and you'll see it as a theme here, are the patterns, are the, the similarities between what you see in different cities. So when we're talking about street photography, though, I, I quoted from Clive Scott's book there, you know, people sometimes confuse perhaps documentary photography with street photography. They may be two sides of the same coin. Are you documenting something? Are you engaged in street photography? What exactly does it mean? And I like the definition by David Gibson in his photography manual book. 
He says, it's any kind of photography taken in a public space. It's usually of ordinary people going about their everyday lives. Street photography's core value is that it is never set up. This aspect is non-negotiable because the guiding spirit of street photography is that it's real. Well, that's good to say, but you can still take a dull picture just because it's of ordinary people and it's real. There needs to be something else. And many times when you're taking the pictures, you shoot first and ask questions later, if you will. You want to make sure you get what has struck you in that moment, and then you can worry about if you have time to take another shot of it or just capture what you have. Next slide. So this is from Beijing. I was there, and it is a man with a young woman kite. And what I liked about this picture when I saw it was the man isolated against this background, uh, clearly of some type of park or public place. And unlike many of the kites you'll see, this wasn't a stereotypical Chinese kite. It wasn't a dragon. It wasn't something you might expect to see. He'd ridden his bike to the place. And what was interesting to me was this older guy with this young woman he was going to send up uh, into the sky. It just struck me as, as a contrast and as a moment, and it told me something about this particular individual. Next slide, which brings us to the classic point that everybody always cites. You can skip that one. What I'm going to do, rather than put the slides up that talk about my comments, I'd rather keep the image on the screen while I give my comments. So we're just gonna go through. We all know Henri Cartier-Bresson, everybody talks about the decisive moment, but it's good to go back and read the context of what he was talking about. And inside the movement, there's one moment at which the elements of motion are in balance. And you seize that moment and hold immobile the equilibrium. Sometimes it happens that you stall, delay, wait, you wait and wait, and then finally you push the button. And then you see if you did it right at the decisive moment, you fix the geometric pattern without which the photograph would have been both formless and lifeless. So his decisive moment is not necessarily a moment of an expression or, or humanity. It's the overall visual impact of the picture. Where I disagree a bit is wait and wait and finally you press the button. If you wait and wait, it's gone many times. And, and I will always shoot first. And then if I have time, I'll go back and try to fix my composition or do things a little bit more. And also, I don't want to be seen. You know, once they look at you, several things can happen. <laughs> and not all of them are good. And I'll come to one of the bad ones in a moment. Um, so shoot first. But Another point I want to make, and I'll talk about this as we go through the images, is the more photographs you look at, the more art you look at, the more you absorb composition, you start to pre-visualize and you see things and you could be anywhere and something will remind you of something even subconsciously that you've seen and you know that's the shot. Next slide. This is an example of that. This is one of my favorite pictures I've taken. And if you look at that picture, this is in Copenhagen on um, a little street called Istagada, which is Copenhagen's answer to 42nd Street as it was. It's now somewhat gentrified. I actually stayed at this hotel, not because of her, but I'd, I'd, I'd ask my travel person Find me a hotel within about 10, 15 minute walking difference of different distance of the conference hotel so I could save a little bit on the rate. And I ended up here and I'd kind of forgotten. I've been to Copenhagen many times, but I'd forgotten exactly the street. So early in the morning, you can see the sharp sun coming against it. You see her shadow. I did brighten up a little bit of the darkness of the hotel. But to me, the moment, if you will, was the cigarette at that straight horizontal angle. And you can see the white cigarette, how small it is, but it stands out and you see it. And that was the moment, it was her taking that cigarette pretty much early on in the life of the cigarette, you know, after whatever she'd been doing all night long and a moment. And to me, the cigarette made the picture. It's a, a harsh light for what, presumably is a harsh life, life, 
and this little quaint hotel. Not in the picture was, was another prostitute who actually grabbed my arm and asked me if I wanted a good time and I told her no. I, I don't have a picture of her, but this one I, I liked. So next slide. So if we go to Robert Frank, what he said in this interview was he was tired of romanticism. I wanted to present what I saw pure and simple. And I think that's what has guided me in, in terms of the street photography is just ordinary people capturing a, a moment. Most of what I have here are people by themselves, sometimes in contemplative moods like this other person. Next slide. This is in Colonia in, in Uruguay. Um, what I, I liked about this, you've got this middle-aged kind of balding guy reading his menu in this cafe and almost as if the mannequin wanted to get another look at him. And she was somewhat enticing in her dress. And I wondered why this guy picked this cafe to go to. Um, and just a little bit, I think I said, like um, Robert Frank said, it's what I saw pure and simple. Next slide. Another critical writer that helps inform street photography and what I've been doing and what you can do is Roland Barthes in Camera Lucida. And he talks about the studium and the punctum. You know, the studium is the overall scene, the basic background, if you will. And then the punctum is the little detail or element that breaks it. The cigarette in the, to me, in the, uh, in the picture from Copenhagen, or in, in the other picture, perhaps the, the line of sight from the mannequin to the, to the person. I listened to a lecture the other night on, on this, and according to this particular person, James Elkins, if you go on YouTube, you might look at James Elkins, got a series of lectures, he includes some critical work on photography. He says for, for Barthes, it was very personal. It wasn't an objective detail, it was what he reacted to. I don't know. I always look at it. There's another interesting book that I didn't put the site down for, where somebody talking about the great works of art, and he always said in each of these works, there's a little hook, some detail that if you find it, really changes your perception of the picture. And in photography, sometimes you'll see it, and the more photographs you look at and the more art you understand, you'll know it when you see it, if you will. Uh, but otherwise, sometimes when you're looking at your photographs, and I, I mean, I'll take hundreds, if not thousands of photographs, you know, because you can do it now with digital. And sometimes I'll see something in a photo that I just hadn't seen before. And that's in essence, what they were talking about with Barthes. It's what you react to when you see it, that you didn't focus on it, that was there and kind of makes the picture for you. Next paragraph, next slide. So here's an example of that. Again, this was in Rome. And again, this was the moment the, this priest puts his head out the door, this massive door, and you see his white head draws your eye right to it. And he's looking at this woman sitting on his church, reading her newspaper, not coming inside. And if we think about the studium as the church facade and the young woman reading, the punctum is, is his white head. And you can see, even from this distance, the, the line of vision, you know, making, making contact. So I thought it was interesting in its own right, but it also ties in with the kinds of decisive moment, punctum type of analysis that we've been talking about. And it raises all kinds of questions that make you think about it. Why did he choose to look out the door at this moment? Did somebody complain? What's going on? Why is she sitting on the church reading her newspaper? Is she waiting for somebody? Or does she likes to sit there? And why does he seem so perplexed by it? Next slide. So another writer, Jerry Thompson, in his book, Why Photography Matters, said this. If all the right things are in place, a photographer will learn from the world as much as from her own growing skill at finding pictures, he or she will learn to prefer pictures that present the world on something like its own terms, as much as those terms can be deciphered. So if you think about the Rome picture, I captured this little moment between these two people in Rome that would be gone in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. 
but it was that moment of their lives and the little intersection between between the two of them. Next slide. One of the more interesting places that I went to when uh, it was before I was chair when I, I was helping the then chair of our section organize a legal exchange trip. He was from Buenos Aires. He really wanted to go to Cuba. Well, everybody else could go to Cuba except Americans. It was just opening up at the time. And we were fortunate that Jeff Laurenti, who Obama had not quite the ambassador, but he was basically the, the key diplomatic figure for the US down there. We had a little reception at his place. So we didn't have tons of time, and, but I would find time early in the morning before the meetings or later to try to walk around. I don't know if anyone here has been to Havana or to Cuba, but yeah, you have. So I felt very safe. I mean, nobody really bothered me. I don't know how, how your trip was. Um, but anyway, uh, this was on the Esplanade and I was struck by the scenery and this young man looking out and you can see the lighter pants and the dark, even with black and white and even on the screen, you can see some of the details. When I shot it originally, I had a lot more of the Esplanade. So it curved around. I didn't like it. I wanted to really bring him closer and focus on it which is another thing why you shoot several shots. I mean, I'll shoot the big shot. I'll, I'll get in as close to try to shoot as well as I can in the camera. We all know you're supposed to try to take your best shot. But sometimes when you get back and then you realize it's not quite straight and you shift it and then you lose something you wanted, better to take a few extra pictures at different distances and get it to, to work off of. Next slide. The other thing about this picture I want to mention, the Havana picture, was it also brings to mind the, what we call the Rukin figure. You know, some of you may know the, the painting by Casper um, David Friedrich, the Sea of Fog, with the lone figure standing in the, in the mountainous area, his back to us, looking out over this big landscape. You know, the Rukin figure in, in German is looking at the world as if you're standing in the place of the person you're, you're observing. So I kind of like to do that for a few reasons. One, I find it interesting. And two, the lawyer in me says, if you shoot them from the back, you're not getting their face and you remove issues of privacy invasion. So I will talk about privacy later, but that's another reason why many times I like to shoot from the back if I want somebody in the scene. This is in Madrid. Here's another line of sight type of photograph. And this was another one where I shot about three or four pictures. The, the woman was standing, then she was squatting, and this, this older guy sitting there. <laughs> it speaks for itself. This one, yeah, I wonder what he's He's probably checking out the 50% price. Uh, uh, but, but it was just interesting. Again, uh, you know, it, it speaks for itself. But what I also liked about the picture, again, you can make associations and, and analyze it. I always think of the, the story when I look at this of Susanna and the elders, of the elders spying on the, on the young woman. So you, when you go and you look at art and you'll see painters in some ways being derivative, taking a biblical story and, and painting it in 1650 with, with Dutch clothing instead of biblical clothing, and they adapt it, or you'll see his, history painters and so forth. Photography, you take what you get, but it doesn't mean you can't see metaphor in what you're doing. So I saw that in this. Next slide. And, and the Buenos Aires one is similar to that. This was in a church. Uh, the, the man of the cloth is clearly asleep, you know, with his head back. And again, the line of sight from the, the, the Christ figure looking at him, and you wonder, is this a dream? Is he dreaming it? This is reality, it's a real photo, but you can use your imagination when you see it and hopefully see something more in it than just, as we talked about earlier, a documentary shot. This was the moment. Now, maybe he'd be sleeping for another five minutes, so it's a long moment, but at some point, that, that scene is gone. And the, the chances of finding somebody sleeping like that with the line of sight in this, it's not gonna come along very often. So you grab these shots where you find them. This was also indoors, which is another thing you learn is pay attention to your shutter speed. You're, you're always in a balance 
because with, with a really fast shutter speed, you'll freeze the motion and eliminate the blur, but you're going to get a lot of noise or it may be too dark. So if you get it dark and you try to bring out the detail, then you have to deal with the noise. So I try to pay attention. Now I generally will shoot shutter speed for this thing and I'll worry about the darkness later. But oftentimes I would let either in program mode, see what the camera does. But you've got to move quickly also because the camera clicks and you don't want to wake somebody. Next slide. This is Budapest. And this is a sculpture. These are the um, shoes on the Danube bank. And this is a memorial on the east bank of the Danube River where the um, Arrow Cross militia shot Jews and threw their bodies into the river. So to commemorate that, you know, they had taken their shoes off. You just have the shoes. And I saw this older woman bent over walking past. Now, if you've been to Budapest and you've been here, you will know that you don't have to be walking that close. There's a pretty broad sidewalk and then up a little bit, a little hill, and then there's the big sidewalk where you could be walking across. So she made a deliberate choice to walk down close to the shoes. And I obviously was down there and I, I shot, you know, took the picture of her. And it's a calm scene in contrast to the horrors that took place there. It also raises the question when you're traveling around and you see interesting sculptures, if you just shoot the sculpture, you're shooting somebody else's work. And in a way it's documentary. So you try to find either lighting or an angle or something. And here, the woman, the older woman, she may be old enough to have remembered these days. I don't know, but I thought that captured. And again, if you think about the decisive moment, I took her at the beginning. So you have plenty of space for her to walk. Everything is a decision. And that's where I, I, I took the picture in that moment. Next. So this is in Zagreb, Croatia. And this particular spot is the stone gate, which is a shrine or chapel uh, between the upper and lower parts of the city, which you pass through. And apparently in the 18th century, there was a chapel there with the picture, the Virgin and Child and the Virgin and Child painting survived the fire. So it was deemed a miracle. And if you go, what she's looking at is the picture of the Virgin and Child encased in uh, pretty much a safe place. And you can see people have bought their plaques. Now this was hard. And if you look really close, I mean, it took a long time for me. I think I had only one shot of this because you know you move quickly and I won't say it was blurred, but it wasn't tack sharp. So I did the best I could, you know, to bring it to where it could be. And, you know, from here, it looks sharp. But the point is, what I captured was her expression, her face. It's almost Caravaggio-like, where you've got the dark and, and the light shining on her face. The cane, you tell a lot about her by all the details in the image. And her moment of contemplation became a shared moment with me. I'm very careful when I shoot these kinds of photographs. You know, my first rule is I don't want to disturb anybody, particularly in, in, in a spiritual type of place. You know, that's how I feel. And then the photographer keeps saying, but the shot, the shot, got to get the shot. And, you know, you, you balance these things. So if I'm far enough away and I won't disturb and I don't feel that I'm being too intrusive, with one exception, which we'll talk about later. Uh, I will take the shot. West. Yeah, go ahead. Where, what's the light for? It's, what they, what that light for yeah, there's no, it's just the, the exit of the gate on the left was coming in. I don't use flash obviously with, with somebody like that. So, and I probably in, in processing brightened her a little bit. Um, but you got to be careful with that too, because if it's disproportionate to the shadows, it looks off. But I probably brightened her a bit, but and she had a, a dark dress on. But coming in, you come in, there's a door. It's, it's like going through an archway. So it would have been natural light. Next. This speaks for itself. 
this was this this guy sitting there i think he has an eye uh, you know his cell phone i don't know he's got his cap out but sitting around the corner was this drawing she walks in beauty like the night clearly you know not what not what the uh, Lord Byron had in mind in She Walks in Beauty, this particular uh, figure. But the juxtaposition of the man soliciting money with the graffiti of the prostitute you know, and the graffiti on the ground just struck me. I don't know if he realized she was there or not or why he took that spot. But again, when we look at the moment and, and the contrasts and what is in an image, this is demonstrative of that. The other thing I will say, one of the things I've been doing for the past numerous years, I'm generally a commercial lawyer. I deal with money, people who want it and people who don't want to give it up, and I litigate. But I've also gotten very much involved in business and human rights issues. You may hear about you know, ESG and these types of things. And one of the things that is surfacing now are people's rights of dignity. And I think about that a lot too, when you go around taking pictures like this, you know, everybody has dignity. I'll talk about a photograph where uh, th this came up in, a, in another context. But if you think about it as well, the work of say, Lewis Hines, who photographed and whose photographs of ch photographed children at labor and whose child labor photographs actually led to real reform. And when you look at his photographs, they are dignified. They are projecting these children in these horrific work environments with dignity. And I think about that too, when I show something like this, or I have this kind of a picture, I don't feel that I'm intruding. I feel that I'm, I'm capturing something and also helping bring some dignity to him. Yeah. And forcing by architecture and abandoning shots. Uh -oh. uh, it's an interesting, uh, you know, today's graffiti is a hundred years time relics. I mean, you go to the Met and you go to the Temple of Dender, you'll see that um, here. I liked it and I left it. Sometimes I will get rid of it, you know, or, or I, I there is a cave over in Witherspoon Woods. You know, if you've ever been to Devil's Cave, if you hike in that area. There's graffiti all over it. I want the rock structure. I want the cave. I don't want the graffiti there. So I try to take an angle, even though I miss part of the cave, that doesn't have the graffiti. That kind of stuff I don't like. Here, I tolerated it. I could have cropped it, I think, tighter. You're right, and got rid of the graffiti. Um, I think it was just a judgment for balance of the picture, and, and it fit in. Uh, but I take your point, and, and I find it I mean, I have sometimes cut out the telephone wires because they annoy me uh, on a shot. I like the graffiti. I think it is the picture. Yeah. And it's well, it's well positioned. I mean, if I started to clone it out, I might have affected the, the, the texture. And if I cut it, I probably would have had to cut the hat. So that's the other point either it goes in its entirety or it stays in its entirety i couldn't really cut it in hand i wouldn't want to also it gives you different shades of white you're right next slide so this is pretoria in south africa now this area was listed in the guidebook but i, I probably should not have been wandering around by myself there um but th th this is early in the morning, and this is another, you can see the cigarette sticking out of, of her mouth at a slightly angle. And like Copenhagen, she's looking out on the morning and she owns the world. I mean, this is her place. And I liked this shot. And I also deliberately kept this in there to, to keep something in the foreground. Yeah. The, 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 those I left, but I probably should I probably should take them out. Sometimes they do add, this was the character of the place. I mean, where I took the, the phone wires out was shooting in um, Kingston Mill, the bridge from Route 27 to get rid of the wires and just have the mill. But you're right, I have to go back and fix that. <laughs> I didn't. Now, Pretoria, though, 
is the one place where I was actually physically attacked, not here. Strangely, this, this was a fine place, but I was more in the center of the city, uh, a center square. And usually when I travel in these cities and have my camera equipment, look around, you know, put my back to a wall if I can, or a sting, I'm very conscious of everybody around me. And I thought I had done it this time, and I had. This was, um, this was maybe three or this was five years ago, maybe. Um, yeah, and like, not going to make this show where to see, look at it, but you showed a picture where the woman was walking and one of the children passed in front of her. Because I shot quickly. <laughs> you didn't have time. I, I shot, you know, she was looking away. I shot. Um, and you know what? I could probably go back to to see if I have others, but that's an idea. Like I said, I wanted to get something in the foreground there. Uh, everything's a balance, but that's a good point, you know, and everything is a judgment when you're doing it. I was telling my dramatic story about getting attacked. You know, so, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, well, that's good. You should be. But in any event, um, these two kids came at me knocked me down. I had my arm around the camera. I kept kicking out and I held them off 30 seconds, 45, 50 seconds. People were coming and then they ran away. So, well, if they'd had a gun or a knife, I mean, but I, you know, I'm not going to carry a gun. But the thing is, I, I felt pretty good that in my 60s, I could still kind of defend myself a bit. But it just raises the point too, when you're photographing and you get into the moment, you really need to be aware of what's going on around you and don't be, you know, you don't be a hero. There are times, I mean, I'll walk if I'm in a strange area or something. I try to walk the edge of a sidewalk near the street. Um, sometimes I won't keep the camera around the neck. I've changed what, you know, what I carry around, almost like it's in a holster. It's in your bag. I don't keep it that way. And um, you, you just have to be very very careful where you are. Sorry? How old do you think they were? They were late teens, early 20s. But I had my camera and they didn't take anything else. And other, you know, people started to come up. I mean, they figured they would just grab it and run. That was the only time I really had that. I mean, I've had other experiences, uh, but not, not physically attacked like that. So, and then I went to my conference and I was like, what happened to you? So... Anyway, next slide. Oh, okay. I've tried to. All right. The question earlier, if you go back two slides, was on the um, why I didn't shoot more to the other side to show what she was looking at. And it was just because I shot quickly before she looked around and um, I may even have done another shot. I just don't remember, but it's just a judgment. I wanted to have something of the foreground uh, in the shot. All right, go two more. Yeah, no, no, keep going forward. Yeah, so this is Santiago, Chile. And you can see two women and you can see they're collecting bottles. This is early in the morning, a lot of fog there. Later in the morning, the sun came out and it was like a, a headlight through the fog there. But this is, where is this? What's this name? This is the, um, I don't have the name of the statue. But what I liked about this was I thought about, you know, the Gleaners, the famous painting by Francois Millet. You know, he talks about the Gleaners. And if you go to the barns, you'll see somebody else does a painting of the rag pictures. And if you look in photography, Eugene Atche would photograph the rag picker. So again, with that kind of background knowledge, when I saw this, I saw that. I saw something that had been a subject of, of art and photography for a long time. Again, I didn't want to just shoot documentary style, the statue, although the fog effect is kind of neat and that would have been enough by itself. I shot about five or six of them, you know, sometimes individually, sometimes others. And I debated when I was looking at all these, what would be the best shot? What can I do? And I brought out as much as I could the detail without distorting or, or, or doing it so that it's legible as to what they are. And again, I kept 
two bottles in the foreground there to have something in the foreground. So you're making these decisions as you're going along, but you've got to think quickly. Sure, sure. Let me go to the screen and see if I have what you're talking about. This? That? That's one of the women. You can see her hair coming down, her hood. If you looked at the actual print, you'd see perhaps more detail on the screen. You're not seeing it as much. I'm sorry? You can see it? Yeah. All right, next slide. So this is Hanoi. And yeah, thank you. I, I like this because on the one hand, and to me, you know, what is the punctum? What is the detail? The man's hands. I mean, you look at that, you're like the cigarette, you're drawn to it. But at first I thought I screwed this up. I should have had shutter speed priority and I should have capped. But then I, the more I looked at it, I really liked the motorcycle in motion. It contrasted with the sharp man walking slowly. It gave a sense of speed. Everybody else is in focus. And you can see the guy's head almost turning as if he's looking at me as a photographer. So this is a market area, the old city part of, of Hanoi. Yeah, go ahead. So you shoot in burst mode at all? No. What I, for, for street photography, I just, every now and then I might set it to burst mode to try to get a bunch of it, but normally one shot at a time. Look at something like this picture where there's so much going on. Yeah. That in the burst mode in this type of scenario would give you a lot of different options as to what things are going on. No, that's another good point. One of the things I like about speaking is I always learn and get suggestions from the audience. So please, I mean, the. the yeah. Work in low light areas or areas that are static, you know, like you see it. But it's something like this, and there's just so much activity going on that there's probably things that you wouldn't even notice if you're not looking at six, eight, ten photos of the same scene. It's a good point, and I have to have to start doing that. Um, but you notice that the, the timing is so perfect. You notice that the person on the right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and and so much of that becomes luck. I was in in Japan. I saw, and you'll see some shots. I saw something that would have fit in with that series of people walking against buildings, and I I use autofocus still instead of trying to set it uh, for infinity. I know some street photographers do that, and the camera wasn't cooperating. And he's moving, and I lost my moment. So I shot him against another wall, but it wasn't the same. It's almost like, well, I'm going to get him one way or the other. I, I, I had, I think I was in St. Andrews. I'm pretty sure it was in Scotland somewhere. And it was these beautiful, like, Georgian houses. And I saw out of the corner of my eye, this little old lady with you know, the white hair, the bonnet. I mean, it was something out of Masterpiece Theater. So I'm standing there and I'm waiting for her to come in across. So she's the picture. Nothing's happening. So I look and she said, I'm waiting. She was waiting for me. I almost said, you're the picture. But I couldn't, I couldn't say that. So I shot the thing just to say I was shooting it and thanked her. And then that was gone. So, you know, we all have the ones that got away. But I hadn't really thought about the puddle. But that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, but it's another example of shooting first and worrying later. And it's funny, I had a note here about not a machine gun, which goes to your burst mode. Sometimes I just shoot the picture, but there's something to be said for what you've indicated, having the machine gun type approach. Next slide. So this is Chicago, um, more back home. This is on Michigan Avenue. I just like the silhouette and, and this, this person sitting there, the epitome of waiting. And then if you think about the, the slogan there, mankind, and it's the uh, Airbnb, she's waiting for the bus to travel, and yet she's sitting in a place that's advertising travel all over the world. And the person becomes every person, every person who's waiting. 
she did her, I think it's a she, I've tried to figure it out. I'm pretty sure it's a she. She looked at, you know, did her shopping. She's going home. Say this, so going back to the birth story. Yeah. This kind of photograph here isn't necessarily what I was talking about because obviously this is a very static image. However, there is also something to be said for shooting in birth mode when you're talking about the handheld. Yeah. Because you're not pressing the button and the camera shape on the second or third picture actually can be sharper than the first picture you take. So even if you took this in burst mode, it's the same image that you're taking four or five times, but the third or fourth image might be much closer to the work. I, I agree with you. And sometimes what I've done is I bracket for five stops and I'll put it on, you know, a whole number of things, just press it and it gives me the um the changes in exposure. I do it that way sometimes as opposed to just setting it on on burst mode as you as, as you say. Um here I probably just didn't think of it. Uh, let me do one more. I was told we should break it around. Let me do, let me do two more. Yeah, and then um, we, we can break and then I'll pick up the pace as I, we're almost done with these, but I really appreciated the comments. Next one. This is Agra. Thank you. And then Agra is mostly known for the Taj Mahal. So I've got my pictures of the Taj Mahal. It's my luck when I was there. One of the four towers was with the scaffolding. You know, I've had that once. I think it was in Zagreb. I had the church one visit. Scaffolding was on one. Next time I was there, it was on the other. I could never get it, get it right. Um, yeah. Now, this was also taken from a moving vehicle. You know, I was in the van. That's when I used my shutter priority to really do that. And I cropped it. I maybe could have cropped it tighter to be closer to the animals. But what I really liked about this was the girl in the far right. And you see her just looking out at the at us. Yeah, that's to me the detail. That, that's who I saw. I think her father or somebody else is in the picture. I hadn't seen any other people until I looked at it more closely. Yeah, and but the buffalo, this was Agra, this was India. And what did I think about with this? What do I associate this picture with? No. <laughs> well, let's ele elevate a little more intellectually. Christina's world by Wyeth, you know, where you have the, the young woman looking out in, in her own world. I saw this as, as an Indian Christina looking out on her world in Agra. Yeah, that's another good detail. Agra. Oh. You've been? Didn't it? Okay. Yeah. Well, we went there. Um, the problem with it was not not the Taj Mahal, but the problem was, you know, they had arranged a tour for us. So you're on their tour and you go to all the souvenir shops and then all this other stuff. But just being in the back in Delhi, there was another type. I forget the name of it now. But to me, it was even more impressive. And you can go without all the people and really wander through. Um, start. I don't remember. I'd have to check it out, but it was pretty fast shutter speed. Yeah. Yeah. And the van might have stopped at a light or something for a moment. I mean, so I would do that, but I'd always try to grab a window and, and shoot away. So the, the next one before we break, this is Asbury Park. This is one of my favorites. I really like this one for a whole host of reasons. And here I waited until they were at that distance. You know, I shot them in different ways as she was walking across. And you can see the detail, even on him, you can see the light through the, the arms. If you look at the screen, you'll see more. Um, the footprints on the left, you know, the, the, the morning. This to me was, uh, to the extent Asbury Park would qualify as a city still among all the rest. 
you know, a moment of estrangement, alienation, minimalism. I, I just liked it. No, I shoot in color, but I for, for the city street photography, there's one picture here that is in color that I left. I'll convert it to black and white. I like to use the um, the silver program. Oh, what was it? What? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I like to use more than more than the Lightroom black and white conversion or even using Photoshop. I start with that and I find that that does the best job. But you're right, that's the one I use. Nick, 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 N I K software, the silver one. Oh, I thought I've done it. Okay. N I K. It used to be free through Google. Now I think you can buy the upgraded version if you want to pay for it. They have silver, they have defined, they have about six or seven other programs for sharpening and other things. But the, fortunately, the silver has kept up with all the upgrades I have, and that's what I use. So why don't we take our break for a few minutes, and then I'll pick it up. We're going to take a uh, five-minute break here at the, at the library. For coffee and donuts and a stretch. So you feel free to unmute yourselves and talk amongst yourselves. I put the lights on. Well, I, I have a general knowledge, but I need to know more details. It's like having a Ferrari and driving 55 miles an hour. I might as well get a Honda. you know if he wants us to unmute and talk among ourselves he should mute the people in the room so we could actually talk to each other Hey, how you doing? Okay, John, how are you? 
Good. Oh, you can hear me now. It took me a while to get on there, but I'm glad I was able to get in. What's that? <laughs> it took me a long time to get on. Oh, that's Good show, though. I won't say in the box anymore. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I know. That's why I wanted to say in the box. That, that day you took a picture of us in the uh, India Day Parade, yeah. and then you took it again at the Karate Club. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember? That was in the place. Yeah, yeah, both of those I was there. Good. So. Good. 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 No, I agree. I, I work with Brian. Yeah. You gotta show me a picture of those. How you got those? I will. I'll show you. Yeah, show it to me. That one. I, I, I want to know what what captures your attention. Oh, everyone see. Exceed here. no, that was a long time ago. Twenty oh five. That's a great place to photograph. We have to No, that was probably. Twenty oh four. Twenty oh five. I bet I'm the only one in those days. Probably, I don't recognize a lot of people. I'm a member of 18 years. Yeah. So where did you where did you end up going in India? You were in Delhi. We were in, we were in so many with university. In fact, I have a shot in the back. Um, I was doing the program for the International Art Association. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and I said, How did you get into the Bob. I always liked astronomy. So, I read in one of these, I read in the astronomy magazine. I had to take a piece of the My uncle had given me this one. And I never could get it off of my That's all it's gonna say. You're like, are you kidding me? So I started I started out with my photography. And then I started doing this and going this. Trying to send me. But that's what I learned on, and then I started going in. I had my kind of pen, I went to the well, I mean, you're a candidate. Nikon, I want something. We talked about this, and you know, I talked to DNA people. I, you know, if something happens, I don't want to be following around. That's the point. That's the point. I was. I was in a photo in the army, and that's what I had to do the old way. 
I think All right, guys, we're going to get started here in a second. I'll just take a picture. Okay. Okay, let's get going. You know, we got to be out of here by 10 o'clock. I'm set off to a farm and a cop. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Send me an email and I'll. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, send me an email. I'll respond to your contact. All right, so let's go to the next slide. I'm going to try to pick up the pace and I understand some people on the screen don't hear the questions from the audience, so I'll try to repeat them. This is Cancun. This is just another moment. This actually was a film shot. Uh, I, I understand from some people that, you know, it might have been better if I'd kept these in color. It might be clearer on the screen. It's just a choice. I think for the street photography, sometimes I prefer turning them into black and white, and then I can do it. But you'll see later, there's a couple that I kept in color. This one I really liked, the print on her. And the thing is, this is the public beach. Just going back to what I said originally, ordinary people going about their, their lives. Next. So this is another decisive moment, if you will. The girl looking at the balloon, the man, not sure if he's looking at her or the balloon. For, forms an interesting triangle, which is a classic in you know in art. This is in Paris. I don't know. Maybe it's too cute of a shot, but I always liked it. Just the moment, the girl's face. Just I found it touching. Next. So this is only a few days ago. This was Osaka, in um, in Japan, and. It's hard to explain why I really like this. I only shot one of this. Again, I don't usually do burst mode. I shot quickly. Um, like Atlantic City, not Asbury Park, to me, it's an image of estrangement, you know, or like Pretoria or, or, or Copenhagen. The man is in his world looking out on the day. The woman head down, going to wherever she's going. Presumably, they don't know each other. You know, two ships passing in the night. But to me, this captures something of city or urban life. And also interesting, you know, when you go to Osaka or if you've been to Japan, any of these cities, this kind of a building stands out amidst all the skyscrapers and the, uh, the glass and steel. Uh, next slide. So here's your color picture. And this was also in Osaka. And I wanted to contrast the two pictures. I saw this guy with these socks and this coat and this, this whole thing. I said, okay, I have to take him. So I took it and I have to keep it in color. If I were to redo the picture, I might crop it a lot tighter to bring him forward, but I decided to keep him in the bridge. Um, color is a different type of street photography, I think. And also, this contrasts with what I like to do. I like to capture people in a moment, which I felt I had with the other Osaka picture. This is a moment, but it's more the character of the guy. Yeah, he got the pocketbook. He was just a different kind of a guy. It was kind of chilly in Osaka, so the coat's okay. The cap, the strange socks. Yeah, that's a street lamp. It was uh, still early in the morning, so it was still on somewhat. Next. So now I want to talk briefly about themes and patterns, and we can go through these relatively quickly. If you've not read Italo Calvino's 
Invisible Cities, you should. It's a fictitious account of Marco Polo describing all the cities to Kublai Khan of Kublai Khan's empire, because Kublai Khan had not seen all the places that were in his empire. And when you read it, each it's almost like prose poems, page, page and a half, maybe two pages, with different city names and Marco Polo focusing on a couple of details or a character or some point that he develops in the city. So at times, all I need is a brief glimpse, an opening in the midst of an incongruous landscape, a glint of lights in the fog, the dialogue of two passersby meeting in the crowd. And I think that setting out from there, I will put together piece by piece the perfect city made of fragments mixed with the rest of instants separated by intervals. If you think back on the photos that I've chosen to show here, you kind of get there. You get these little mosaic tiles that help form a bigger picture of a city. That was my goal here. We're moving now from photography, criticism, and theory to what I like to do, which is shoot themes or look for patterns. And it's kind of amazing, not just patterns like you see, geometric patterns, but patterns of what people are doing. Next slide. So Moscow, and again, obviously shot in different places at different times, but I remembered and I knew what I'd shot in one place or the other, and I found this. Next. Or Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Pristina is the capital of Kosovo uh, in the former Yugoslav Republic. And you can see not an exact match like the other one, but the same kind of thing. What's interesting about Pristina is you get the four corners. And if you look closely at the woman, which I did when I pull it big up on the screen, she's actually looking at me, which I don't like. <laughs> Yeah, so we got that and, and, and him. Next. So Philadelphia and Paris. Somebody asked about taking out graffiti. At first I took out the man's legs and then I liked them. It adds some kind of a surreal uh, edge to the picture. Yeah, next. Cape Town and Beirut. And this is another example of what I like to do with... Um, the Rukin figures shooting people from the back um, and, and having them look out. You can call these landscape pictures, I suppose, but I shot them in cities and I, I include them here. The uh, Beirut one, uh, in Beirut, I was there with, um, and there were two women who were, I think, academics from some law schools in the US and they'd arranged for the three of us to go see around so I'm sitting by the window and I'm taking my shots and I think we pass at one point, they start to get very upset because apparently some soldiers or police <laughs> saw the camera and saw the car go by and they got worried. The one thing you need to remember, there's no, there's no constitute, no American constitution overseas. You know, you don't have your rights there. So, but I didn't worry about it. Next. It's interesting to see how people interact with statues in places too. This was Singapore and uh, Pittsburgh. Next. So this is cool. This is, uh, again, by themselves, maybe they're not much, although I did, like the, um, I did like them each individually, but it also shows, again, two women, two completely different places, different continents interacting with the fountains. Ho Chi Minh City is Saigon. Uh, next. So Frankfurt and Sydney. I always liked, you know, I didn't know what to do with the Frankfurt one, but then I matched it with the Sydney one and I kind of liked it. Just people doing their exercises. Again, think back to Italo Calvino. We're seeing snatches of the life in all these cities and it's kind of the same. Next. This is a little bit dissonant. Um, I had another shot of a woman in Shanghai who was selling fake noses and glasses, which probably would have matched more the woman in Mexico City who clearly wanted uh, money, you know, stop and she was entertaining people. 
the one in Oslo, just, I, I had to show that. Look at the look at the line of sight. Look at the guard. No, this is the royal palace in Oslo. So, so anyway, um, uh, ne next next slides. <laughs> this is yeah Dublin and Zagreb, two older people, slightly hunched with the 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 bags. Next slide. And then the same kind of thing, Bogota and Prague. And I almost matched the two men, but one had a case. They're different. And I suppose I could cheat and flip it horizontally to get them walking in the same direction. But these, to me, were more of a match. Now, here the graffiti works. You know, here, here the graffiti works in each picture. I mean, what I like about this one a little bit more than the other one, and I used to match her with the um, the guy, but they were going different directions. Completely different continents. They're not all Europe. You know, we're, we're in South America and Europe. Bogota and Prague are very different cities. Yeah, that's true. And with her, I think I'd originally shot it horizontally, but I cropped out a lot of the, the right-hand side to make it vertical, partly to match, but also because I thought it made a better picture. Well, I can't take full, that was luck, <laughs> but but uh, I can't say I remembered that exactly, but they do match. Next slide. Madrid and New York, and I've got a, you know, a lot of pictures you'll see of this, but I like the, the thin, the short, or rather the tall, the short, the thinner, the, the heavier, you know, they kind of match. One had the newspaper, one had the cane, just friendship. Next. Paris. I mean, to me, that was Paris. And I have a, I have several shots of that with different backgrounds. I decided on this one. I've got other shots like this, but these two, I thought, Quito, Ecuador. Next slide. Abuja and Oslo. Abuja is the capital of Nigeria. This is sort of a man-made lake in a man-made park on the part of Abuja, it's kind of a, like Brasilia, I think it was made to be the capital. The other though is in Indonesia, in, in Jakarta, uh, and this is a canal built originally, I think by the Dutch when they were there. It reminded me of Mark Twain going up and down the river in, in there. And it just was people on the water in the city. It's not an exact match. The next one is closer, but it shows the patterns. Again, with the cigarette, this time a man, you know, capture the moment, looking out on his morning. This is in in Vancouver, um, in the uh, in the gas light district. Um, I have other shots of the man against the full range of the apartment building. It looks like the scene in The Matrix where the guy is in his corner. This raises an interesting issue um, in terms of privacy. There's a case that came out of New York, um, Foster v. Svensson, where Arnie Svensson, in his apartment building in New York, shot across into the other apartment building through open windows. And he got children, he got men and women, sometimes in, in different levels of undress, and he exhibited them and called it the neighbors. And he got sued in New York. New York has a statute that defines your privacy right. And as long as you are using the, the thick pictures for artistic as opposed to commercial or trade purposes, you're okay. And they ruled that way for him. And the cup, it went up on appeal and then it ultimately went to the uh, court of appeals and the photographer won. Basically the court said, this is what the statute says. If you, we don't like it either, but the legislature needs to change it. I gave a talk on this and mentioned that when I was in somewhere in Europe, and there were Germans in the audience, and they said, if that were Germany, you'd be criminally liable. So I would manage to find the translation of the German criminal code, and you're right. If you shoot somebody through a window, 
you're violating that person's rights and you could be criminally liable. I felt he was on the balcony. He was outside the window. I felt I was okay. I didn't know about the German statute until later, or I might've been more careful. But again, you shoot quickly and move away. And sometimes when I shoot something like this, I shoot something else very quickly. Because every now and then somebody comes up, do you just take my picture? No, and I show them the picture I just shot. So sometimes that works. Next slide. This is Havana again and Belfast. Again, the, the musicians are sharp. The people are in motion, just street corners. Next slide. Barcelona and Paris. This is the same guy who blew the bubbles for the girl that you saw before. Um, again, you see this. I have a shot from somebody in London who blew cigarette smoke into his bubbles. And, and you can do that. But that would be very hard to see here. Next. Buenos Aires in Dubai, again, the waiting for the bus. And again, I like to show different continents, the same behavior, the same people, same structure. The one on the left, though, kind of dates itself because it shows a, a movie that was playing at the time, which is now long out of the theaters, but there it is. Next slide. Again, almost the same identical shot across Agra, right? Got it right now. Is, is Agra or Agra? Agra, so I thought, okay, Agra and Jakarta, again, showing just laborers going about their business, the same type of thing. So go to the next slide, back to Italo Calvi, oh, this is Delhi in Mexico. Yeah, the same type of pose. Next, coming back to Calvino, Kublai Khan had noticed that the cities resembled one another as if the passage from one to another involved not a journey, but a change of elements. Sire, now I have told you about all the cities I know. There's still one of which you never speak. And Polo said, every time I describe a city, I'm saying something about Venice. If you think back of all that I've shown you, the original ones, the patterns, the moments, the backgrounds change, the people change, but the behavior, it's one city. That's how I see it. Next slide. And again, just coming back, if you think too hard, the moment's lost. This is a bizarre picture. Looks like she's putting her hand into, his, his, into him. I've never quite figured it out. Next. How could you not take that picture? This was in Prague. And maybe it looks better in color, but I <laughs> just like that. Next. Again, sometimes the billboards form interesting backgrounds for the people. I did a book of photography on mannequins and I really explored concepts of beauty, how it's changed and, and all the rest of it. And I was thinking of that when I take things like this. Next, here's Sonapat, okay? And what I liked about this one, like the Osaka picture, was you see two worlds, people separated a few yards apart, maybe not even aware of each other, but two completely different worlds. Next shot. This is Tokyo and I cropped it tightly. I was struck by the, the, the strong diagonal. And in Japan, I mean, there's like one color suit, which is black and one color shirt, which is white, with some exception, but I couldn't figure out how to get rid of the, the four people at the top, but then I left it because if I cropped it, it would kill the picture, I thought. <laughs> yeah, the audience said it looks like a man in black movie. Next, this is in a museum in The Hague. Just a, an interesting shot, I thought. Next. This picture is Buenos Aires. And when I took the shot, I didn't realize I had the, the boy's head in the picture in the far right corner. And I tried to crop it out. And then I thought it made the picture. That became the punctum. This is another picture. This, these are school children from across the way. This building, this building was the remnants now of the Israeli embassy that was destroyed some years ago. And if you look at the plaque, you can, you can figure that out. But it's an also, it raises the question too, when you look at a photograph of internal versus external information, 
what do you need to know to really understand the photograph? I remember I have a picture somewhere. I have to dig it out. It was made, I think it was September 12th, 2001. And it's just the sky over my house. Well, if you look at it, you just see the blue sky. But if you say this was September 12th, 2001, and you know that no planes were flying that day, the picture takes on a whole different meaning. So this can stand on its own, perhaps. But once you know what it is, and you see the faces, it takes on a different level of interest. Sure. Actually, it probably would be um, allowed. It depends what you do with the picture. Um, I researched that because I wrote a, you'll see it at the end. I, I did the ABA book on photography law because I treated myself as my own client because everybody says things. So I researched all this and I, and magazines and, and contract law may well require you to get uh, releases. But as a matter of law, if you're standing in a public place, just taking a picture of a kid, you're generally okay. Obviously, if you start to, to go down the road of, of child pornography or other things, it's, it's the use of the picture. But something like this would probably be okay. People may get upset. You know, you got to deal with it. But as a matter of law, probably not. But, yeah. Yeah. You may have no expectation of privacy, but you may have some other rights, and we'll talk about those briefly, you know, cert certainly like false light or defamation or, or how the picture gets used. But generally, you're right. Gen there's cases in New York, for example, where it was one where somebody sued HBO. She was part of a crowd scene. She was in a public place. She was fine. Depends, you know, what you're doing. Um, but generally, that's right. Although in, in, in the Europe now with the GDPR, the General Directive on Privacy Rights, there were articles, and I looked at them from my book, that were appearing that said photographers are very nervous now because even if you're in a public place, this is personal information. Some states have restrictions on, on your use of your personal information. But even that, the GDPR has something of a, um, like I described before, an artistic uh, license, if you will, for it. That's the general rule. If you have no expectation of privacy, it's generally okay. There was a case in, um, I think it was in the 50s in Virginia. I found it from my book. You know the famous Marilyn Monroe picture where the vent takes her dress up? Well, something like that happened outside of a diner in Germany. So a woman's dress came up. And the judge was so offended by this that they ruled against you know, the photographer and, and everything else. You know, there's something to that, you know, if you catch somebody in a moment that, that's defamatory or invasive, but generally you're right. Generally, that's your first, photographers have First Amendment rights, too, of expression, but they can be limited. If, for example, you know, there was a case in New Jersey where somebody was on the boardwalk taking pictures and people would buy them from him, you know, taking, but he hadn't registered as a vendor and he claimed he had a First Amendment right. But the court said, yeah, you have a First Amendment right, but there's also a, a health and safety right, and there's a certain ability of people to regulate the hours and what you're doing as well. So nothing is really absolute. Next. So I'll just briefly touch on this. When does a photo cease to be a photo? You know, the perfect versus the good. And people talk about color, but we all don't really see the exact same color. Next. So this I love, this is in Vancouver. And this to me reminds me of sort of Stonehenge or the Druids or some kind of a ritual. This is English Bay and the sun was going down. Now, that's not what you saw if you were there. If you were there, you'd see the whole sky blown out and you'd see these people. But I used the dehaze filter and put it to the end and I got this. And I tried to bring out some detail which maybe you can see on the screen, but I like it like this and somewhere on the right, you can just barely see the speck as a bird up there. Um, is this still the photo? Is this still what I saw? Is this legitimate manipulation? I thought so. I think it's true. Next. Next. Now, this is just a straight photo, and yet 
you look at it, you'd think it's a, it's a photograph of a woman alone contemplating loneliness you know, on the boardwalk. There were a ton of people around, but I just cropped it tight. So I didn't manipulate the photo, but I manipulated, if you will, one into the frame. Is this true? It's not an accurate picture of what was there. You'd see a crowd, but it's true for what it shows. My view. Next. Next. This picture, actually, it wasn't this photography club. I, I submitted it when I was going to the East Brunswick Club before here. And the judge said, oh, you violated the rule. You cut off his, his, his feet. I shot this early in the morning in Qingdao, China, across eight lanes of traffic. I, I saw this guy. This was a picture. I waited for the like one second break in the traffic, and I shot it. Should I have shot a little lower and gotten this? Maybe, but you know. So they they didn't like it. I submitted it to the uh, New Jersey chapter of the Meteor Photographers uh, Group, and Bob Chris, the National Geographic photographer, was the judge. He let it in. So so much for the rules. Next slide. And these are just five people that I found that I kind of liked. Next, out of all the shots I took in Warsaw. Yeah, we're standing outside the hotel waiting for the bus to get to the airport. It starts to snow, and there's this elegant young woman emerges and looks down the street. I love that picture. You can see the snow. You can, if you look closely, you'll see it. Next, Moscow. This was not far from the Supreme Court building, one of the streets, just this guy. Next. This is 1976, and it's a little soft focus. This was taken with a point and shoot. It's like one of my first ever street photographs when I was a student over there. But I love this picture. It's this moment between the two. It's iconic for London. It shows the place. And just this moment of these two people. She very well may be dead now. He's either dead or retired. I mean, I, it's just a moment that I continue to like. Next. This is Tokyo again in the fish market district. And it's, I'm sorry? I got the feet. I sometimes crop out that woman on the far right because I don't like her. She doesn't belong. Um, but meanwhile, again, if you think about Chiroscuro, if you think about Caravaggio, the play of light and dark, and the woman behind the, the counter stands out, and I liked her. Next. I just like this picture. This was Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, what I don't like about it is having the car in the background, but I couldn't, I couldn't maneuver fast enough to do what everybody is telling me to do, which, which is get the better background than everything else. I took her, I think it's a her, as soon as I got it. And um, that was Ho Chi Minh City. Next. So I've talked a little bit about the public place, thanks to your question, um, but I just wanna highlight a few things. You've got four different types of privacy issues you need to be aware of when you're photographing. Intrusion upon seclusion, public disclosure of private facts, false light and misappropriation. And defamation could be its own tort. Again, there's the taking of the picture. Don't trespass, don't do things you're not supposed to do. And then there's the use of the picture. You, you were fine when you took it, but you're using it for an improper purpose. Next. So intrusion of, I won't read it all, intrusion upon seclusion, basically somebody thinks they're alone and you invade their privacy, a private place. So yes, I mean, what, what's, if somebody's in a doorway, if somebody's kind of down an alleyway, at what point is it still a public place? I mean, it can be an issue. Next. So this picture, I probably violated all the rules, but... I was in, this is in Prague in the main cathedral and I was walking around and I was up by the altar area and I didn't realize that they were beginning this. I looked down, I saw the candles, I saw, how could you not take this picture? But I kept saying, you, you can't take this picture. And I said, you gotta take this picture. I think I shot it twice and this was one of them. Now you'll notice somebody is videotaping. If you look straight, he's videotaping. But then if you look, She's pretty unhappy with me. She's looking at me and, and she's not happy about it, but nobody else seemed to mind. And I shot fast and then stopped. To me, it's almost a Renaissance type picture where people fill the frame. It just, I had to take this picture. Now, 
Did I intrude upon seclusion? Is this a public place? That's another issue. When you're in a building, it may be a public place, but they may have their own rules for what you can and cannot do. And by entering on the premises, it's sort of a contractual obligation for you. I didn't care. I love the picture. Next, when I did the photography book, I wanted to use this picture, but I got a little concerned about GDPR. So I told them, make it small. Just keep it small so I at least have that argument. Next. This was Vancouver. Why did I shoot this picture? You've got like the cathedral, the major church in Vancouver, and you've got this guy on the street. I thought it was an interesting contrast. Um, I wasn't happy with the car in the picture. It's more of a documentary picture, perhaps. Uh, I felt in the tradition of a Lewis Hine or a Jacob Reese. A couple on the corner started to talk and chastise me and accost me, telling me I shouldn't be doing it, leave him alone. You and I thought, I didn't answer them, I just stared at them. But I thought to myself, how much money do you give? What are you doing to help this guy? I'm at least documenting a situation where I can show people and maybe engender some outrage. What are you doing? And who are you? I didn't say all that. But to me, you can think about dignity, you can think about whether you're doing a social reform or purpose, or you can take their view, I suppose. Next. Yeah, why didn't I tell the car out? I hate white vans. White vans are the worst when they get into the picture. This is the boat cap area of Cape Town. I love the birds surrounding her. She, again, shooting somebody in a window is this intrusion on seclusion. But I thought it was a cool picture. And I like the birds in motion. Next. Next. Here's my other color picture. This guy, so this was only about um, last month. Guy sitting in, if you read the sign, dirty jokes, $1. And to me, the beard, and I worked hard to get it white and get the detail into the beard uh, sitting in front of this building. Next. So public disclosure of private facts. I'm in a public place. I can shoot him. But this is a private fact. Will it, will it embarrass him? Is this a violation of it's true? Or is it documentary and is it newsworthy? And there's an exception sometimes for things that become newsworthy. Next. False light is kind of like defamation. Some states don't give it as a separate cause of action. Next. So look at this guy. This was Paris. Is this putting him in a false light? Am I mischaracterizing? What if he were a, a man of the cloth in his hometown and, and this got out? It's a true picture. I'm in a public place, but maybe I'm casting him in a false light. Look at his right foot. He's happy. <laughs> Next. Misappropriation, if you take a picture of somebody and then put it on a box of Wheaties, you're taking their picture, you know, using it for commercial purpose as opposed to artistic. Next. So here, I mean, could DeWitt sue me for taking the picture? No, probably not. Uh, they may have trademark issues, but nobody's going to mistake my picture for me selling the DeWitt product. And I always loved this, this picture. I took her about three or four times. One as she was walking, and then when she was there, and I made sure I got the silhouette through the umbrella, and I cropped it tight this way instead of the vertical, which this, I think, originally was. Just, you know, uh, somebody looking in the shop window, another moment of life. Next. And that's the end. This is the book I wrote on photography law. It's now in its second edition. And I talk about a lot of the things that I've, I've just uh, intimated at here. Uh, any questions from here or the people online, I'm happy to answer them. Every now and then some people will say, hey, take my picture, this and that. And every now and then they'll pose, but no, I don't talk to people. In fact, when I take the picture, I look away immediately or, or I make it clear I'm a photographer and I'm doing all kinds of things, I look, if I have my wide angle lens, I do it broadly so it doesn't look like I'm doing. The one thing I won't generally do in a city is have the big zoom lens, because then they know, and I've tried that, and they see the people moving around and then getting out of the way. But with um, the medium range lens or, or the zoom, even if, because I know I can enlarge, I know what I can do in post-processing too. And if I just want to capture the person, I don't need them big front and center. You know, I can get enough detail with what I want to do. And that's why sometimes I really like the wide angle. But 
I have had somebody once in, in Toronto come up to me and say, did you just take my picture? And I actually hadn't. I'd taken the building and I did show him. I got a choice. I can either tell him what to do with himself. I can ignore him or I can be cooperative. Usually I try to be cooperative because even if I'm right, I don't want to spend an hour in the police station explaining why I'm right. Especially in a foreign country, and especially, I never argue with anybody with a gun. Not in a foreign country. Yeah, yeah as I mentioned, um, I like the, the Rukin figure type of approach where I'm seeing what they're seeing. Um, I also, if I like the, the character of the person, but I don't want to worry about privacy issues, I don't take their face. Yeah. Well, I, I really want to thank all of you. I hope you found it somewhat interesting. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions. Or you can have my email on the slide, too. Yes, you have about 15 minutes to pack up and get out before the alarm goes off. Thank you, everybody. We're going to pack up here. we got to be out of here by 10, so we're going to start packing. Thank you. Ready for help? Ready to do